All right. Well, we will start with Ezekiel chapter 33. And let's read the uh, what's printed on our handout today first together. So Ezekiel 33. Um, I actually truncated a little bit. It was supposed to be 7 to 20, but that was really long. And um, we're going to uh, look at some, and some of it is a little bit redundant. So um, we'll be looking at some of those other passages as we go through this today. But let's read what we've got in front of us right now. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Therefore, son of man, say to your people, if someone who is righteous disobeys, that person's former righteousness will count for nothing. And if someone who is wicked repents, that person's former wickedness will not bring condemnation. The righteous person who sins will not be allowed to live, even though they were formerly righteous. If I tell a righteous person that they will surely live, but then they trust in their righteousness and do evil, none of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. They will die for the evil they have done. And if I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, but they then turn away from their sin and do what is just and right. If they give back what they took in pledge for a loan, return what they have stolen. Follow the decrees that give life and do no evil. That person will surely live. They will not die. None of the sins that person has committed will be remembered against them. They have done what is just and right. They will surely live. Yet your people say, the way of the Lord is not just, but it is their way that is not just. If a righteous person turns from their righteousness and does evil, they will die for it. And if a wicked person turns away from their wickedness and does what is just and right, they will live by doing so. Yet you Israelites say, the way of the Lord is not just, but I will judge each of you according to your own ways. All right, the theme for this week uh, is going to be about repentance. And so the Old Testament lesson is a call to repentance by Ezekiel. Um, and uh, so just as uh, a start, uh, the kind of trigger question is this one, do you have an alarm system in your house or car? Well, you can't buy a car without an alarm system on it anymore, okay? Do you have one in your house? No. If you do, why? My dogs. Huh? <laughs> My dogs, yeah. Yes, they go off all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, smoke detectors. Smoke detectors, yeah, would be that kind of alarm. And and that's the second question. Does it ever give false alarms? Oh, yeah. yes. You know? Um, my problem always with the car is that if I'm playing with the grandkids and I lean on this the wrong way, all of a sudden the car is honking away, honking away in the garage, right? You know? And, um, and uh, with the smoke alarm, you can be cooking, and you don't think, it's that bad, but whatever it is, that steam that it's giving off, whatever it is, uh, uh, reaches that fire alarm, and then you can't. We had a new water softener installed last week, and whatever he was doing down there set off the smoke detector in the basement, and they're all connected. So they're going off all over the house. It's like, well, I can't like open the windows in the basement. He, he did something to it. I should probably check it to make sure it got connected down there. <laughs> It's more like it's got power and it's batteries. It's the power and batteries, so yeah. it's got to be back up. And yeah. one of those that's wired throughout the house. Yeah. So you're going to really know if you need Oh, that. yes. <laughs> but false alarms, yeah. Um, 
And then the second question is just one uh, in thinking about this text. When and by whom have you been warned about something you were or might do that was wrong? Who has ever warned you about? Well, your parents over the years. Uh, sure, over the years. Up, you know, they would warn you. And say, here's what you do or you don't do. Or they might say, here's where you go or right. don't go. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, I know when I came to driving with my kids, I always said, you know, if you ever speed, just hand me the keys when you walk in the door. Because <laughs> you, know you know you're not going to be driving for a while. You just know that's going to be a consequence, you know, it's, it's what it is. One, one thing I remember is my nephew, who was long out of high school, but he went on a class trip to Barcelona. And an adult needed to go with him to the planning meeting ahead of time, and my sister couldn't make it. So I went, and they were telling the kids, well, you know, the, girl, the girls have to wear shirts with sleeves on if you're going into a cathedral. The boys can't wear shorts. Don't talk to people on the streets. All these things to keep them safe, safe yeah. on their trip. You know, whether or not they all pay attention. I wasn't on a trip. I don't know. But, um, but the forewarnings of cultural differences that could get you in right. trouble. Right. Um. That you're making me think about every time we've done a youth gathering, you know, you've got all these kids that are in a downtown area, and one of the things you really drill into them is you don't go anywhere alone. You don't go into a store alone. You don't go into a restaurant alone. You don't go, you don't walk down the street alone. You will always walk in a bunch, mm -hmm. you know, so you would warn them. Mm -hmm. You would warn them. When we took, uh, my sister Ruth and I took our mother to Ellis Island the day that it reopened. I mean, we were there for a, a week. Anyway, uh, we stayed in a bed and breakfast north of New York City, and there's a metro that takes you into Grand Central and then out to Battery Park. So the woman at the bed and breakfast was very alarming. I mean, don't, do not have your first, uh, get a, Fanny pack. Have it inside your jacket. Yeah. Don't talk to anybody. You know, the problem. Mm -hmm. So we were all pretty freaked out by the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to get out of this tree. <laughs> but uh, all was well. All was well. Okay. One of my favorite forewarnings was on our honeymoon. We went to Hawaii and we did the bike ride down Mount Haleakala on Maui. And all the way up the mountain, they were telling us, well, you know, don't do this, don't do that. But the one that just stuck out in my mind is on this bike ride down the mountain, you go through a cattle ranch. And they're like, and there are no fences, and there's cattle guards the on the road. So on a bicycle, make sure you keep your wheel straight, because if you turn your wheel, you it's won't do it. Go ahead over Keister. But also, if you see a cow, don't react to it, because it may charge you, and it probably won't but hit you, but it'll hit someone in the line behind you. And we've had people get cow butted off the side of the mountain before. It's like, okay, if I see a cow, I'm not going to react. <laughs> uh, except cow faster. <laughs> exactly. And my husband was behind me. So the heavy ones in the back and the light ones in the front. So the guys are all in the back, like, jamming on their brakes on the straightaway. Sure, so when they sure. Got to the, to the curves, they open it up and just bank the curves really hard. And I'm just like, you go have your fun. I'm just going to get down this mountain. <laughs> Whose idea was this anyway? <laughs> exactly. Actually, it was my parents. They were the ones that told us about it. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, there's, there's a lot of times when we get warnings from other people. Um, and, um, and, and if we look at the beginning of this text, we see a way to the watchman can fall down on the job. So would somebody read for us verses 1 to 6? 1 to 6 of chapter 33. The word, go ahead. go ahead. Okay, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, when I bring the sword against a land and the people of the land choose one of their men and make them their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people, then, if anyone hears the trumpet but does not heed the warning, and the sword comes and takes their life, their blood will be on their own head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet but did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. 
If they had heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and takes someone's life, <clears throat> that person's life will be taken because of their that person's life will be taken because of their sin, but it will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. So the watchman's job is to sound the alarm. You know, and, and we heard last week in Jeremiah much the same kind of thing, you know, and people didn't like much that he was sounding the alarm. Mm -hmm. You know, it might make you think of a time when somebody warned you, but you you really didn't want to hear their warning. Good night. Yeah, Good yeah. Night. You got to be kidding, you know. I can, it's not going to hurt me, you know, and you you think about how, especially um, I think about how both as a young man and as um, a father of young men and young women, you know, in our youth, we often feel like we're impervious, you know. There's a man I worked with who, you know, all his years he lived in his house, he cleaned his gutters. So one year he decided to clean his gutters, and as an older man, he couldn't do it as well, and he fell off his roof. Right. Luckily, he landed in the bushes and was okay, but it's like, yeah, there's people for that, and you have children. Have that come over and clean your gutters. <laughs> yeah, there comes a time when you got to say, I shouldn't be doing that. Right. Yeah. Um, so Pastor, this, the way it starts off, son of man, I have made you a watchman. Who is he? Is he talking to Ezekiel. Ezekiel is... I thought Ezekiel wrote this. Well, Ezekiel wrote this, but it's the word of the Lord came to me. Oh. So he's saying, this is what God said to me. And it's an interesting term because um, obviously Son of Man becomes a messianic term, which would point to the prophetic office of Jesus when it's used of Jesus, because it's a prophet. So it's the word of the Lord came to me. And, and what he's saying in Ezekiel's day, and remember Ezekiel's prophesying at a time when God had had it up to here with his people's idolatry. And... Um, You've probably heard me say it a few times. The straw that broke the camel's back when it came to God's anger and frustration with the people of Israel was <clears throat> excuse me, when they brought idols into the temple courts. That's when he said, I've had all I can stand and I can't stand no more. <laughs> That's, now you've, so they keep talking about like in Ukraine, the red line, you know. And I just saw something in the Wall Street Journal, I was reading a bit of it this morning, and it said that um, the Russians had sent some drones over NATO territory, which may be a testing of where's the red line? Is that a violation, sending those drones over NATO territory? And what happens if we shoot one of those drones down when it's over NATO territory? Is that a red line for them? You know, it's, it's uh, I think uh, the gamesmanship is really, really tense, and of course it's extremely deadly right now. But it's that question of when have you crossed the line, we say, right? And so uh, God had just had it, and now what he's doing is he's saying, Ezekiel, your job is to tell them destruction's coming. It's not a matter of if now, it's a matter of when. And, um, and it's your job to warn the people. And, and so to sound the trumpet, to proclaim that warning, that's your job. And you can fail if you don't proclaim what I tell you um, to do. Now, um, just to get it out in front of us, let's read... Um, Somebody read verses uh, 7 through through uh, 10. 7 through 10. That's the other part I kind of cut out of Sunday's reading because it was so long. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade him from his ways, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn away from his ways, and he does not do so, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. 
Son of man, say to the house of Israel, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Okay, so this is what I cut out was the warning to Ezekiel, which was, um, I'm going to hold you accountable. You ever have somebody say that to you? Now I'm going to hold you accountable for this. You don't know they actually said it, but there was the implication. But there was the implication. <laughs> well, sure, because when you, any kind of work you do, you're held accountable, right? Um, you're accountable to somebody, and, and to be held accountable means that you take responsibility and um, and that means you get the glory when everything turns out okay, and you get the blame. No, you yeah. never get the glory. You never get the blame. You only get the blame. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And, and, uh, and we've got all kinds of phrases for that, like the buck stops here, you know? Um, and, uh, and, and one of the challenges we have in our in our culture is people taking responsibility for what they've done. Political leaders are very good at pointing the finger at somebody else rather than take responsibility. Yes? So, is he talking here only about physical death or is he talking about eternal life? That you're going to die just physically or does that mean you're not going to heaven? Um, so the answer would be yes, depending on that person's trust or faith in God. Because obviously, um, when the captivity happened, not only did you have people who were unrighteous go into captivity, but you also had people who were righteous. Think about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, there were plenty of people who got caught up in the punishment because they were a part of... Uh, of a group, even though they themselves were not the ones who um, who instigated, who were unfaithful and and instigated the fact that they were going into captivity. Um, it's one of those truths that the righteous also suffer unjustly sometimes, and and of course it not only happened in the Old Testament, it happened in the New Testament too. Um, Peter, um, his uh, epistles are really addressed to people who are going through a time of persecution, severe persecution, and how do we handle it? How do we look at it? You know, and uh, there's that passage we used it in worship uh, sometime in the last couple of weeks, where he says, um, uh, you know, if you shouldn't suffer for being a bad guy, for being a crook, a thief, a murderer, or anything like that, but if you suffer on account of the name of Christ, then rejoice that you were counted worthy to suffer for the name. So it's not that the suffering is different, but the reason for it is different. Therefore, how I view it is different. Uh, and here you've got him saying, uh, yes, it, so some, it, it was going to mean death for some people, physical death. But it also was going to mean spiritual death for those who didn't turn, which is why you've got the call to repentance uh, that that follows. So, um, so he's saying, uh, turn, turn. Uh, what problem do the Israelites have beside their sins in verse ten? Yeah, yeah. So what they're saying is we're getting kind of what we deserve. So how can we survive? And this would probably be a question from somebody who is one of the righteous ones. The note in my Bible says the first time the exiles expressed consciousness of sin, previously they had blamed their fathers and even God. Right. So now they're, they're getting the message. They're getting the message. Now, now finally it's come home to roost. It's my fault. You know, 
Um, and sometimes, you know, it's, it's hard to see what's our responsibility or not. I was just talking about this with Judy because they're talking about their kids and stuff and getting jobs and all that kind of stuff because their kids are at the age where they're out of high school and, and all of that. And, you know, one of the things that's really difficult today is that there are so many kids who just don't show up for work. Yeah, there's, there's people who just don't, you know, and I know she was talking about the, you know, the debates that the next mayor of Milwaukee, you know, and they say, well, we need good jobs. Well, <laughs> you need good employees if you're going to have, if, if you want an employer to provide a good job. Um, I can remember when, uh, um, who was it? Was it Ridge? When he was working for the uh, gear company up in Grafton. And they were looking for a place to put a plant. What do they look for? What kind of workforce are we going to find in that place? Are these people who are going to, do they have a work ethic that says they're going to show up? And, and one of the challenges, um, I think, with some of uh, uh, the places that need jobs is that the workforce isn't, doesn't have a mindset that says I'm going to show up all the time. And I've used this example before. Guy, Kasango Guy Cabau, the French-speaking African immigrant pastor, pastors a church that meets at Benediction. Um, when, we, when I first met him, he was working for a printing company. And, um, and it, it will tell you something about the way that an African immigrant, at least like him, felt. He said he, he started working, and when he started working, he had very little English skills, but he didn't need a lot to work in this printing company. It's someplace over around uh, Mill and um, 43rd or something like that, this little shop back there. And, and he said he started to get like more responsibility and promotions and, and, uh, and and he says some of the guys who had worked there for more years than he had worked started to complain to him. How come you get? How come you're getting the promotion? How come they moved you onto this machine and they're paying you more? We've been here longer. And <laughs> he said, I told them. So here's the secret, gentlemen. If you show up for work every day, every day, if when and, and when you work, you don't just complain about the work, but you actually do it and without complaining. And whatever he asks you to do, the boss asks you to do, um, that maybe isn't a part of your job, you do it. And when they say, well, we've got a little more work than we can get done in our 40-hour week, we need some people to volunteer to come in to work you know, a four hour, six hour, an eight hour shift on Saturday. If you volunteer and you show up and you do that work, then the boss is going to treat you the same way he's treating me. But until you do those things, you know, it's not a, it's not rocket science, you know. The other thing is you have to show up on time. Show up on time. And don't take extra long lunch periods and break periods <laughs> and go right. out smoking. Right. Yeah. It's, everybody knows it's not that. rocket science. Everybody it's not rocket science, you know. Um, I'm going to tell you one little thing. Um, when I was still part of the bell system, I, I got into employment, and one of the things they said for uh, young people, was that they liked to hire people from Milwaukee Lutheran mm -hmm. because they would be on time, they would do their work, they would be a good employee. And that was a very interesting thing to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That there's a, there's a certain character <laughs> that goes along with. Um, hopefully it's still true. Hopefully it's still true. Um, yeah, so just, just showing up just showing up and being faithful about it and instead of 
whining and complaining, or trying to blame somebody else like your forefathers. Well, and and so this is uh, one of the places where God is very very clear about His heart. So um, if you look at verse eleven. What does God say? I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And so this is a call to repentance. It's a call to come back. And um, where was I? Was that Sunday? We were talking a little bit about No, where was I? <laughs> Somebody was talking about this with. with um, what does it mean to take pleasure in the death of the wicked? Maybe it was at church last night. Uh, Tim Keller, um, I think, has this wonderful example: is that you you know that you're thinking like like Satan when your enemy suffers and you say, "Good, <laughs> they're getting what's coming to them." They're, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. What's the what what is another option besides taking pleasure? in the problems that come to somebody who is evil or wicked. What's the other option? Compassion. Or kind of Compassion. Understand. Pity. You know, that's the other thing is to say, I pity a person who is experiencing that difficulty because of the choices that they made in their lives. Well, and if an evil person dies, you're pretty confident that they're going to help. That they're so going that, up. So they have eternal damnation to look forward to. Although if you're in church last night, uh, because we were talking about betrayal and Judas, um, I made the point that we don't know where Judas is. Because anybody knows death by hanging knows it doesn't happen like that. Could he have, while he was dangling on the end of a rope, said, God, I'm sorry. You know? I don't know. Would there have been a moment in time when he would have uh, uh, thought back about all the things that Jesus said about forgiveness and grace and, and said, God, I need you to be gracious to me now? I, d I don't know. Um, and it always bothers me when people make a judgment and say, well, he's in hell. Um, because uh, Sometimes they'll say because he committed suicide, but so, we, and I realize that, that in the past, and um, there were times when in certain pockets of the Christian church, suicide was considered the unforgivable sin. But there is only one unforgivable sin in the Bible, and it is unbelief. And you don't know, you know, when somebody commits suicide, whether they do have that moment of repentance, especially if they've done something like take an overdose of pills, or you have no clue what's going through their brain. You have no clue whether they have a moment when they say, God, I'm, I'm sorry, even though they can't reverse what's already been started. And that's why it's difficult, and, and very often people who commit suicide are in the middle of some significant depression, which is a whole other issue because depression is as much physical as it is emotional, spiritual, um, because there can be um, problems with the brain chemistry, which is why they treat it with drugs um, uh, very often. And so, it's just a real challenging subject. The other thing that I remind people of is that we're not, um, I don't want to offend anybody, but we're not Roman Catholics. What do I mean by that? How does a Roman Catholic view repentance? It's a point in time. So I sin, I repent, and I'm good until I sin again. When I sin again, I've got to repent again, right? And repentance is more of an action than it is a condition. Therefore, if I sin and I don't have time to repent before I meet my maker, what happens to me? Because I haven't asked for forgiveness. I haven't gone to Mass. I haven't fulfilled my... I've gone to confession. 
Um, well, hence purgatory has to be a place where those, un even though you died in faith, they still need to be paid for, expiated. How does that differ from Lutherans? Repentance isn't so much an act as it is a condition. And it's ongoing. I live in repentant faith always knowledge, uh, in the knowledge that I am a sinner who needs the grace of God. And, and it's not a matter of did I actually go through the task of repenting? It's a step back. Do I actually believe I am always repenting because I'm always sinning and I always need God's grace? Um, somebody once said it's like being pregnant. Either you are or you aren't. Right? It's not you are one minute and you aren't the next minute. You are, you know, and when you're in, when you're a believer, this was something that uh, Luther especially started with in the 95 Theses was that repentance is a way of life rather than just an action. It's a heart attitude that is always with you. I am always cognizant that I'm a sinner in need of God's grace, and when I'm a sinner in need of God's grace, then. Whether I've repented. So here's another way to think about that. So what's the difference between somebody who commits suicide, maybe somebody who has a little bit too much to drink and um, uh, runs into a tree, because they didn't have time to repent. repent either. And it was their actions that led to, now granted they didn't do it deliberately, but it's still a sin. Or, take a step back, what if I just haven't taken care of myself and therefore I've got hardening of the arteries and I die of a massive heart attack? Now ultimately, if it's because of the way I have taken care of my health, it's ultimately my fault. Maybe I didn't even know that I had the hardening of the arteries. But those donuts were not good for me, right? <laughs> and the first wake-up call I have is a heart attack that takes my life. Well, I don't have time to repent. So if repentance is an action that has to happen for every sin, known or unknown, um, how do you ever get it done? And that leads to what uh, in Luther's day and age they call the monster of incertitude, which is this. How can I ever be sure I've repented enough? How can I ever be sure I, you know, have done enough good works in order to make up? Because that's a whole other story. We're not going to get into that one. But the whole treasury of merits thing in, the, in Roman Catholic theology. But... His point is, is that you could never be sure of your salvation and how that wars against the, um, the biblical truth. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I mean, it is absolutely, positively. You have passed from death to life, Jesus says. You, all of the definitive comments about our salvation being secure and sure would be gone. And, and so, yeah, just thinking a little bit more deeply about that repentance. It's more of a of an attitude, a heart attitude, a faith attitude than it is an, an action. And God doesn't, it breaks his heart. Oh, that's what it was, it was the weeping, right? The weeping this last Sunday. Jesus weeps over Jerusalem, why? Because it breaks his heart when he calls people and they say, no. And, 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 and so God says, I take no, did, did Jesus, so last night I was talking about Judas a little bit, and, and, and the question is when, when, when Jesus responds to Judas and he says, friend, do what you came to, friend, do what you came to do, what do you mean by that? And I said last night, I said, it'd be interesting to know what Jesus' tone of voice was, right? Was it sarcasm? Oh, friend, you know. Or was it genuine? Was it another invitation of Jesus to trust, to follow, and friend? Because he was one of the twelve. 
you know? Um, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. The character of Jesus would make me believe that it was more the latter and not the not the former. But did, did Judas took the money back, though. Yeah. So he was a little bit repentant. Oh, he was more than a little bit. Yeah, because, so, uh, I didn't go into a lot of detail on this last night, but this is uh, what I'm teaching, the difference between contrition, oops, and repentance, big words. What's contrition? Sorry. It's being sorry. So this is sorrow over sin. What, so when, when, when you do something wrong and you say, I'm sorry, that, and you really feel it, that is contrition. Now, sometimes when you say you're sorry to somebody, they might say, well, what are you sorry for? Are you sorry you did it? Are you sorry how it hurt me? Or are you just sorry you got caught? Or are you just sorry because now you got to deal with the consequences? Right? There's a number of things that you can be sorry for, but but just the the, the sorrow um, can be very genuine, very will, but it, it it doesn't become repentance until so repentance is sorrow, yes, but it also adds faith. And um this is the way, um, his name is Phil Giesler. Um, way back in seminary, he did a class on um, teaching confirmation. And, and this was from his materials. I, I always remember this. And, and I still do it today. I will take you to the part of scripture where you find Judas and you find Peter side by side. And what do you know about Judas and about Peter? Well. Judas betrayed him with a kiss, right? So you've got a betrayal here, and you've got a betrayal here, only it's not done with a kiss. It's done by denying that he even knows him. Remember, he's three times, and he curses, you know. All, huh? More than once. More than once, right? Now, the question is, is when it comes to sorrow, was Judas sorry? And the answer is, yes. How do you know that? Well, you know that because the money is returned, and you know that because of the suicide. And, and that's the genuineness of the sorrow. Now, what about the quantity of the sorrow? Was he really, really sorry? Well, sure he was, because he, he gave all the money back. He didn't keep a little bit of it for himself. And he killed himself because of the pain of what he had done. What about Peter? Was he sorry? What happened when the rooster crowed? He wept bitterly. And yeah, so the key word is the word bitterly. It wasn't just a little bit. It was, you know, because remember Jesus, uh, uh, Peter uh, said to Jesus, you know, though everybody else betray you and desert you, I'll never desert you. Oh well, yeah, Pete? Yeah. So he goes out and he weeps bitterly, which tells us that he, his sorrow was genuine. His sorrow was great, that it was bitter. His sorrow was genuine, the tears, and that it was great, the bitterly. What's the difference? It's where you look for the solution. Right? And what Judas is, yeah, sure. I always, I had this idea in my mind, and it's wrong, I'm not sure, that it means to think again. Mm -hmm. Metanoia, it's a change of mind. Mm -hmm. Or people will say the U-turn. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, meta means change. Think of metamorphosis. What's changing the form, the morphe, 
of a butterfly from a caterpillar to a to a butterfly. It's that's meta means to change, and um, and the noia is the mind. It could be, but it's not mind instead of my meaning my brain, the neurons. It's my thoughts and you could say your heart and mind together. And what metanoia requires is a change, a turning, a direction. And and here's the way I like to think about it is when when Judas is trying to solve this problem, he looks to himself. So who's his God? Who's going to fix it? Yeah. Does it fix it? No. Where Peter looks to Jesus and eventually experiences because um, we know he was there at the cross we know that he was uh, um, one of the first ones to the tomb we know that Jesus spoke with him privately don't know exactly what he said though but we know that he spoke to him privately and um, and so in the middle of of Peter's heart is I still have a Jesus who loves me and forgives me. And if you think about it, um, both of them also, uh, this just occurred to me, I had never thought about this before, but Jesus to both, told both of them, you're going to betray me. Remember, he, he tells Judas uh, when he's asking, is it me, is it you? And Jesus says, yep, it's you. Right at the Last Supper, and when Peter is saying, "I'll never deny you," he said, Be "Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times." He saw their failures. Uh, he warned them, but to use Ezekiel words, what did Peter do? He turned. And, and if Judas turned in that last moment while he was hanging himself, then God would forgive him too. Not depending on his own righteousness, but the righteousness that God alone can give. So the next question, does God call every Christian to be a watchman like Ezekiel? And if he does, where? So this is a Bible trivia question. Where do you think that God has said that you are responsible for a brother or sister in Christ? Or for other people, for that matter? When your brother sins against you? Go and tell him alone, Matthew 18, right? Um, and, and it's interesting that in Matthew 18, it is uh, if your brother sins against you, in Matthew 5, it, it's... If your brother has something against you, so if somebody thinks that you're the one who sinned, then he says, leave your gift at the altar. First, go be reconciled to your brother and then bring your gift. Or the apostle St. Uh, Paul in Galatians chapter 6 says, if, if you see somebody caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him, but be careful that you don't fall. Or he says, uh, don't judge others so that you will not be judged. Take the log out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to pick the speck out of your brother's eye. And this goes all the way back to the beginning of scripture because what's the question that God asks or Abel asks, I'm sorry, Cain asks God, am I my and it doesn't say it in the biblical text, but the way God responds, the answer is yes. Yes. And there are a number of places in the scriptures like that that it, it tells us that we are responsible. And um, so sometimes I've had this happen as a pastor when I've gone to somebody who hasn't been regularly in church or something like that and had a conversation with them about it. They'll say, well, it's nobody business but mine. I say, no, it's not. Not if you believe the God that I believe, not if you trust the word that I believe. It is my business. It is my business to, to speak into your life and to encourage you. And, and, and you can say it's not my business, but 
You're not my Lord, he is. And so he's made you a part of my responsibility. Yes, ma'am. I remember learning, if I have this correct, that that's why we are all responsible for missions. Because if the, all the people of the world have not been had the opportunity to hear God's word, it's our fault. Because it's we our didn't, fault. We didn't do our job. Yeah. We're their watchmen, and we need to be responsible for missions. Yeah, uh, and um, that's reflected in the hymn. Now I'm trying to, if you cannot be a watchman standing high on Zion's hill, you can tell the love of Jesus, right? Hark the voice of Jesus crying. Who will go and work today? Um, and, and so over and over again, the, the scriptures remind us that it's not just relying on professional preachers prophets who have the, the job um, but it's every one of our responsibilities and, and then that leads us to more of an application question who has God called you to be a watchman for personally or in your neighborhood um, I am technically one of the neighborhood watch captains in my neighborhood um, and in your world. So you just think about all of those of us who, who have children or uh, brothers or sisters or family members that uh, we're called to be their, their, their watchmen. Yes, sir. We can also think about that in a positive sense. I have more than once said to Ed Maytan, it encourages me to see you here in church. Yeah. The mutual consolation of the brethren is the way the Lutheran confessions talk about it. It's the encouragement and blessing we're able to bring to each other to be a watchman for. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, move on to the second reading, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Um, so if you go there in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm preaching on the gospel this week, so if we don't get there, you'll hear about it on Sunday. Okay. And let's, um, let's uh, uh, read what's on your sheet together. While you're reading, I'm going to step out for a brief break and come right back. So let's get you started. For I do not want... Okay, so the Apostle Paul is writing again to a congregation that has all kinds of 
problems. All kinds of problems. Whenever you feel bad about problems in the Christian church, just go back and read 1 Corinthians and realize that there were churches who were a whole lot more troubled than um, at least any congregation I know of. And here he's, um, uh, he's been talking to them a little bit about uh, his uh, running for the prize. If you look at the immediate uh, uh, previous paragraph before chapter 10, um, uh, well, actually the immediate two paragraphs, he's talking about what he has been seeking to do. So if I go back to verse 22, he says, To the weak I become weak, to win the weak I become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. If I all do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I might share in its blessings. And then he uses this analogy of a race and of a, of a, a fighter. He says, don't you know that in the race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize, for everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I don't run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So he's, um, uh, he's, he's really thinking about reflecting on um, what uh, he can do to be successful in his uh, walk with Jesus. And he recognizes that there's all these challenges that require some self-discipline. And one of the things that can be helpful, he says, is what we have in front of us here is the examples that we see in the past, especially in the scriptures. Um, so um, he talks about uh, uh, that. I'm going to skip the first expense of vacation you've taken. That's about the traveling and that kind of thing. But what kind of spiritual heritage did your forefathers leave you? He talks about the forefathers. Um, uh, Being a Lutheran. Huh? Being a Lutheran. Being a Lutheran. Being a practicing Christian, mm -hmm. you know, um, the or faith. Grace baptized went to Lutheran schools from kindergarten through <laughs> high school and Lutheran nursing school. I mean, yeah, right. I, Cut me, I believe you're Lutheran. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's just realizing that we have a we have something that's been handed to us, and it's not uh, most of us know just. The fact that we went to church every week is that they lived out that kind of life each and every day. We had family devotions. We had, you know, and I didn't grow up in a preacher's home. Uh, but we did uh, celebrate the goodness of, of God in, in many, many, many ways. And it's that spiritual, spiritual heritage which we've received that then we have an opportunity to pass on. If we look at... Verses 7 to 10, he talks uh, about uh, four different types of sin committed by the Israelites. So let's just look at those. What did they do? Idolaters, sexual immorality, um, being an unbeliever, eating and drink. They, yep, the, so that's the first one is the... Testing the Lord. And then testing the Lord and grumbling against the Lord. So you've got, actually, you could count five of them here if you take all those. So, And what he's doing is he's pointing back to Old Testament um, uh, examples. So the, um, the people sent down to eat and drink got up to indulge in pagan revelry, right? Um, one of the verses that I think is interesting is number 12. So if you think you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Mm -hmm. So even if you think you've got it handled, mm -hmm. you don't. Right? So the saying in English is pride goes before the fall, which is also a, a reworking of another proverb that says much the same thing. And it, it, it's saying, don't, when we say, don't get cocky. Right? Don't get cocky. Um, 
And one of the challenges is that we can feel secure and as a result not see the temptation or danger that might trip, trip us up. It blinds us in ways to those kind of temptations. And, he's, and so uh, Paul is here just reminding them that, that they have the same kind of weaknesses. Now why would these be a specific warning to the Corinthians? Why would Paul use these examples? Well, you got to know a little bit about the Corinthian congregation um, and about the Roman culture. So when he talks about uh, indulging in, in pagan revelry, what, what was typical in a Roman Greek culture at this particular time when it came to their food orgies? They would eat, they go out and puke it up, and they come back and eat some more. For the pleasure of eating. You know? Um, and, and so you've got this kind of thing, and it was, it was prevalent, it was talked about in society. It was something that was not looked down on that kind of revelry. So if he, if he quotes from the Old Testament here from Exodus, it's for that reason. What about the sexual immorality? Oh, yes, the temple prostitutes. The temple prostitutes. Uh, so if you understand where Corinth is, Corinth is uh, on the, the part of the map where the bottom part of Greece meets the top part of Greece. And it's just a little isthmus that connects the two. And uh, so early on, what would happen would be um, the ships would come from one side, the uh, goods would be ferried over land to the other side, and other ships would pick it up and, and take it on its journey. Eventually, they cut a canal from one side to the other, so you didn't have to take it off the ship. But what that meant was you had a lot of Sailors in port, which meant that the world's oldest profession. Only it was sanctioned here because they had a temple in which they had, according to um, extra biblical sources, a thousand temple prostitutes. So you could, ser you, you could honor and serve God by paying money and having sex. So when you think our society is really, really bad, you just got to remember, <laughs> there have been times when it's been worse. So that kind of sexual immor immorality was going on, especially in Corinth. Um, testing the Lord, I don't know exactly how that one would relate, uh, again, uh, in particular in Corinth. Uh, but grumbling, certainly there was a lot of grumbling that was going on about um, other people who were also Christians, a lot of grumbling, and so there's all these factions and everything else. Well, they follow him, and we follow this guy, and and uh, when it came, when he gets to the Lord's Supper in chapter 11, you got the rich coming in before worship, uh, and the poor coming in before worship, and they're celebrating a love feast of potluck, and the rich would sit in one corner, and get stuffed and drunk, and the poor would sit in another and be hungry and thirsty. And, and Paul basically says, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know? Um, and, and, and that was very typical. They'd take some of the bread and some of the wine, set it aside for their celebration of the Lord's Supper after the meal was done. But it, in extra biblical literature, they were called the love feast, the agape feast, but there wasn't a whole lot of love going on in this congregation. Um, and so he'll say, do you humiliate those who have nothing by the way that you're acting and behaving? Um, so the, he, he lists some examples from the Old Testament um, for these uh, folks. And, and then says, they all happen to us as examples. How do they serve us as a warning for us today? Checklist. Can we sit down for revelry 
Uh, I can tell you, I, uh, my middle boy, Peter, turned 40 this last Sunday, and after church we went and um, celebrated with him. We went to Copper Dock for their brunch with uh, his family, my parents, and um, uh, and her, his wife's parents, and had a nice time. Uh, it's been a long time since I've gone to a brunch, and all you can eat brunch, right? And what so often happens that all you can eat brunches is you eat too much. You eat too much. Um, I uh, worked in a restaurant that served a brunch when I was in seminary for a little bit. McTavish is part of the Marriott. Uh, hotel there and uh, I can tell you when we had brunch there was more wasted food than any other time we served because people would take more than they could eat or they'd take a bite of something and say oh I don't like it but they'd already put a bunch of it on their plate and you would throw out so much food it was sinful yeah one of Chuck's favorite stories is my folks are still alive and Pandles and Bayside was still open and we went there for Easter for their Easter brunch um, yeah. as, a, as a treat for I my parents. Place. Well, first of all, it was packed. It was miserably crowded. And then everybody was you know, eating way too much. And Chuck says, I don't know if gluttony is a good way to celebrate Easter. Seems <laughs> 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 it's, it's really wrong. Seems but, really wrong. But, but the problem is you spend, you know, I think right. your meal is like $50 a person. It's yeah. like, you know, you're like, you know that. I want to get my money's worth. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, loose <laughs> 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 or you you grew up being part of the clean plate club. Well, you know? there's that. And uh, there's that if you take it, you better eat it. You know. Yeah, people are starving in Africa. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, what, give them this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like sugar. You can have it. Give them. Send it to them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So certainly, we are tempted by some of these same things. Certainly, sexual immorality is a big problem in our culture. You know, there's a reason why there's, um, I don't even know how many now, I know it's around 50 sexually transmitted diseases. And I've always said you can eradicate them in a generation or two. If um, every man or woman would only have sex with their partner, with their spouse, uh, in a generation or two, there'd be no sexually transmitted disease. They'd just disappear. And it's, it's simple, but is there a reason why that's a problem yet in our, our culture? Um, yeah, certainly we have, uh, and grumbling, does that still go on? Um, are, are we as Christians sometimes uh, tempted to test God by when something uh, bad happens, I'll often hear it when it's a health issue, and God, if you'll make me better, or if you'll make this person better, I'll do this for you. Mine is, uh, God, if I ever win the lottery, I'll, I'll use half of it for missions. <laughs> the problem is, is I never play the <laughs> lottery, so I don't think I'm going to see that. But you know, it's that kind of bargaining we we like to to do, and and, and we're tempted to do it, especially when something tragic uh, happens and, and we're looking for a way out and say, God, if. Um, so let's end on this. What are the four things that Paul says we can be sure of in verse 13? That it was so interesting that the first thing that he mentions is, you're not so special. <laughs> Everybody is subject to this problem. Everybody is. Yeah. It's not just you. And we think about that even with Jesus, because in the book of Hebrews it says he was tempted in every way as we are and yet without sin. No temptation, that's the first thing he says, is you're living in a broken world and you're broken people and stuff is going to happen. Um, second, God is always faithful. He's never going to turn his back on you. Um, and he will also be faithful to your promises. And one of his specific promises is that he won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, it might be more than you think you can bear. Uh, but
But are you relying on, on all the resources that God has put in your life? That's what I find people, when they're like Judas and they say, I gotta solve it myself, that's when they can't bear it. Um, but you see, in suffering, what it does is it turns us to look outside of ourselves and say, I can't go through this alone. I need you and I need you to walk through this time of suffering. Um, and, and so God says we can bear it when we look on the resource, use the resources he's placed around us. And the last one, he'll provide your way out. Um, he'll provide you a way out. <clears throat> um, logically, this is uh, solving a dilemma. What's a dilemma? Right, and the way I was taught is when they said uh, dilemma, they were talking about uh, uh, a bull that's got really long horns, and if you go this way, you're gonna get gored with that one, and if you go this way, you're gonna gored. What do you have to do? You gotta break one of the horns, <laughs> logically. Okay, that's the way you think about it, logically. When somebody says it's either or, is there another way? And I, I've said sometimes that's been my place when there's been conflict resolution because I got two people who come in and one of them says, well, this is, this is right, and the other one says, this is right, and it's got to be solved this way, and I'll say, well, as a non-anxious presence, I can say, well, how about doing it this way, or 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 how about doing it this way? In other words, sometimes you're so blinded in your emotional state that you're frozen and you can only see one solution, of course, it's yours. And, and, and it's an either or and it gets into a battle and somebody has to step back and say, well, maybe there's a third way. Maybe there's a way. And, and that's where very often leaning on other people to provide us that perspective can be really, really helpful. That's why in the Proverbs again and again it talks about seeking wise counsel. Somebody who maybe isn't as emotionally invested as you are in that particular moment, who can help you see things from another perspective in a different way, see another alternative. And, um, and, 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 and so God says he'll provide you a way out so that you can stand up under it. Um, you can endure it while it's there. And we better close there. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that as we walk through life, we know that we are broken people and too often we try to rely on ourselves rather than looking to you for help and for hope and for strength. And uh, today, is, uh, uh, as your word has reminded us, we need to look outside of ourselves uh, for forgiveness, for peace, for strength, for a way to make it through the challenges that we face in this life. So as, um, as, as we get set in our ways, uh, continue to send your word into our lives, calling us to turn, to repent, to return to you that we might experience your blessing, your favor uh, in our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.